Thanks everyone for coming tonight, either online or in person. Tonight's meeting is going to be sponsored. I know it's hard to read on the whiteboard, and I'm just going to say it. it's going to be sponsored by the um, School of Math uh, Computing and Mathematical Sciences here at university and the New Zealand Open Source Society. So the latter basically offers the or us to use the big blue button instance that we use for running the um, online meeting here. As a bit of a background, um, last year I needed to have a quick user interface for a little project under Linux and I thought oh, I'll just use Tekinta because it's going to be simple and I don't really want to have any dependencies and if after a week I gave up, switched to GTK and Glide as in sort of like an ID for developing and within half a day I was where I wasn't after a week with Tekinta. So I decided um, to shelve Tekinta stuff for the time being. Okay, for fast forward one year, once again, I don't want to have many dependencies, <laughs> but this time it has to be cross-platform as well. Um, so it has to run Windows and Linux, and therefore I decided to give Tekint another go. Um, and I did an extensive Google search of approximately two or three minutes, and I came across PyGoogoo. I guess it's a Python graphical user interface builder. That's just my, my guess that it's actually derived from that. Um, and it seemed like a reasonable choice. First of all, open source. Secondly, actively maintained. Um, thirdly, didn't have to pay for anything. Uh, it wasn't an online service or anything, not a website where I download stuff from then, but I can run it locally. So I thought, okay, I'll just give it a go. So what you're seeing tonight is my experience uh, with doing something in Tekinta um, and trying to get that actually going with uh, Pi Google then as well, which I've seen basically the first time last week, I think Wednesday or so. Um, and since then I probably sp uh, spent like maybe a couple of days or so on it and actually got something working and far quicker than compared to last year with Tikinta. So I was actually quite pleased with that. Right. So what's Pi Google? So according to their website, <clears throat> Pi Google is a RAD tool, a rapid application design tool to enable quick and easy development of user interfaces and mainly aimed at the Python's Tekinta module. And <clears throat> these user interfaces are basically then saved as XML files. And with the PyGoogle Builder, which is a separate uh, library, they can be loaded by applications dynamically at runtime whenever you need them. So you can separate out each sort of like interface that you have and load them whenever you need them. And you can see that PyGoogle is also inspired by Glide, which is the user interface designer for GTK, one that I've been using for a number of years for doing stuff there, <clears throat> which was quite neat. Um, so on the bottom right, so you can see sort of like an interface. So um, in the top, you have um, certain widgets that you can um, sort of like um, add to your tree of um, widgets where you nest things on the left hand side in the center of you you see actually what your user interface will look like in live preview and on the right hand side for whatever widget is currently selected in the tree on the left you see all its properties and you can change things um, over from the default values to something that you want um, and down there's also the um, link to the by google designer this presentation is being recorded and will, at some stage later this week, uh, be uploaded to our, our um, YouTube channel as well. And I will post that on meetup.com then as well, where you can find things. So how does it actually work? So you can basically create your user interface with this designer. It, in order for running the code, it basically then just generates a little bit of wrapper code um, for loading the XML and building it with it, and then um, further integrating with events and whatnot, you can tie those into your um, application then. So you can also then retrieve objects from the user interface via the names or IDs that you've given them. You can then um, import certain variables. We, we go into that later on, uh, what the variables are. Um, you can then also fill in the callbacks um, that you've defined 
um, within the user interface and Pi is sort of like the wrapper code then sort of like has um, sort of like certain stops for that. And of course, you can also set the theme, either ones that come with Tikinta, or you can also then um, have some that are a bit more fancy and then you can, of course, do some um, theming on them as well. One thing that I noticed was, which stumped me for quite a while was um, despite you actually being able to define um, accelerators in the menu in the user interface builder, they don't actually get bound to any sort of like of your callbacks that you've defined as well. So you actually have to do that menu there. That was a little bit annoying. And um, I mean, later on you find out that whatever you did display in the user interface in the menu as accelerator is basically just text and Tikinda doesn't really care about. So you really have to do that low level then um, binding. And another a little thing that I um, tried coming from other um, user interfaces um, having control dash O means that's control O, and if you want to have control shift O, you have to use an uppercase, not a lowercase O. So it's like very <laughs> sort of like little details that you have to be aware of rather than control shift O, which you would do, and then you don't care about the case. The case is actually important. Another thing that can be getting maybe a little bit annoying is that when you're starting to create a larger user interface with lots of buttons, many menus and whatnot, when you start typing, I think the interval is about one second. It starts of you not doing anything. So when you're thinking about a name and then keep typing again, then it actually starts refreshing your center view of your user interface. And when you keep typing, it gets the order of your characters wrong. <laughs> so you're writing backwards. So it keeps the index where your cursor is the same but you're typing basically and always at that position and you're slowly filling up sort of like backwards wherever you were it can be really annoying when you have a larger user interface so it's the trick is wait for it to refresh think about what you want to write write fluently sort of like what you want to type don't do any mistakes <laughs> write that and then wait for it to refresh again and go somewhere else but that's okay um once you know it was a little bit frustrating to start with it has a fixed number of widgets, basically what Tekinda allows. Um, if you want to have other ones in there, so I've seen um, a GitHub issue on that, on the design uh, designer, how you can actually, in theory, um, add additional ones in there, but I haven't followed up um, whether that really works. But in theory, um, you're supposedly be able to do that. How to get started? Well, it's a typical way in Python land, you basically just do a pip install. Best to do that in a virtual environment because I've seen it that it doesn't come um, through my Ubuntu or um, sort of like Linux Mint repositories. So you really have to uh, pull it in from PyPy. If you only want to have the PyGoogle builder, not the designer, then you can just um, install the PyGoogle package. You don't need any other um, dependencies that are being pulled in by the by Google Designer or additional codes if you want to keep it clean. Cool. So that's really it. And then you start developing. So that's it. Um, so we have Ian here monitoring. So in case you're typing something in the chat, Ian will interrupt me um, because I might not always uh, check the chat here. Stop there. All right. Just um, okay. We'll create a little virtual environment. We'll install. Um, oops. I do. So look at what the modules are that get pulled in. We have relatively few. Um, so we have 
the Pi Google designer itself, Pi Google, um, other things like the Tom Lee screening for things that I've actually never used before, <laughs> Pi Gold style, markup save, macro and whatnot. Um, I'm not quite sure where they're actually being used for other things behind the scenes. But nonetheless, having that installed, we can now basically um, start up by Google Designer. It knows that we're Linux, um, TK is 8.6, and um, you can see the various version numbers for by Google and by Google Designer. Um, so it may be a little bit small to see. Um, I'll try to write um, slightly larger code. Um, so we can basically start with our top level. It's whatever. So by default, you can see down here it's by 200 by 200 pixels only, so not particularly large. Um, we can use the geometry property over here to set it, for instance, to 800 by 600. And you can see it immediately redraws basically its top level element. Um, and then we can, for instance, have, if we wanted to have like a notebook in there, um, as you can see, it's not particularly great the way it's being layout. So you can go on the layout um, tab. So we want basically, um, we want to anchor it to the Northwest. Um, we want to expand it basically, yes, and we want to fill basically X, X and Y in both directions. So we want to, um, whenever the user basically um, resizes the window, we want to also make sure that our notebook um, changes with it as well. Um, whenever I feel like that I need to do uh, see how it looks like, I can just do a preview so you can see uh, the menu preview, preview and top level is F5. So you can see, oh, okay, cool. There's my window and I can resize. Cool. Um, we of course want to, so it always starts here over, so you have two types of widget, TK, pure TK or themed TK. So it usually starts with the themed TK. So if you then do other things um, with colors and whatnot for your own um, widgets um, to apply that via, for instance, IDs, names, and whatnot, then you can do that. Um, it also comes with a few helpers and whatnot. So for instance, here yeah, you have a notebook tab actually in there, top level menu, tree view columns, uh, scroll by helper, which is actually not a bad thing to have. Um, play Google widgets, um, so dialog, scroll frame, calendar frame, a few other bits and pieces so in the end, which can be quite helpful. So if we're going in to add, for instance, a tab, um, and in the tab we add another frame, Oops. display something, so and then we can see our tab showing up. So in our tab, so here's our tab, we just call it tab first, so you can see how it starts redrawing and things. Um, and if I stop anything for a second or two, it immediately refreshes in the center. So I just call it first, and you can see that it actually has our first tab. Um, if you want to duplicate things, it's quite easy. Um, so you can basically just copy and then go on the parent and paste there. Um, so you can see here we have um, our second tab. Now, of course, it removed um, the ID because it has to be unique. So it's tab second, and I'll give it another name. So we have now first and second. Um, so if we run that now, we can see, cool, we have two tabs now, for instance, here. And if we, for instance, want to um, move things around, this is a little bit um, let's say not so obvious. <laughs> um, if you look on the widget tree, you can see item up or down or in the grid. Um, so you can also see other things there. So for instance, if I wanted to move the second tab up or down, then I can do that just by selecting the widget and it does that basically within um, its parent that it moves things around. 
So that will be the first one. Um, for instance, um, if we wanted to have a bottom panel um, where we're displaying things, for instance, then we could have another frame in there. Looks ugly, I know. Um, we'll just give it a height, I don't know. Let's make it 40 um, with a layout. We're anchoring it this time in the west and expand. We want to fill this time on the Y and expand this through. Oops. Oh, y, of course, not. X, that's the one. And for some reason, it changed that again. Yeah. Good question, why? Um, now here we have that's the one. Let's do a self test. Why is that? It's 200. Oh, the top is going to fill off. Fill off. It's going to reach. That's one of the mysteries. Sometimes you do something and you have no idea why the hell it changed like that. And that's one of those. To be honest, so if I have, so is the bottom frame too big? Well, the bottom frame it only has a height of forty, right? Oh. So from that point of view, it shouldn't do anything. Um, what about the stick? So I turned off. It was expand. That was the problem. Sorry. We. It's actually yeah. supposed to be a fixed one. Sorry, my fault. It's supposed to be a fixed one of a height of 40, otherwise you get funny effects. So, okay, now we actually have, um, I'll just place a label in there. Um, Hello world. Um, layout once again, so we want to have it on the left. Okay, so we run that now, and we have our label underneath, which is basically independent of the two tabs that we have. And we can then have different interfaces within um, each tab, and then do something with it. To get it doesn't have status bar. Um, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Um, that that's sort of like one of the things that you have to build yourself. So this would be, for instance, one thing. Another thing that I haven't quite figured out is actually sort of like queuing things on the GUI thread with updates. So when you're doing things that take a long time that you're not blocking your user interface from refreshing anything, I know how to do that at GTK, but I haven't figured that one out yet, this one here, but eventually. Um, so this is really sort of like my journey so far from last week till now with to kinder and what actually can you can do with this thing so yeah um so if you have questions put them in the chat ian will basically then let me know and i can then jump in so we can also always make this a little bit interactive if you have questions how to do something i may not always be able to answer that but we'll give it a go cool so that is that and of course if i save that um We'll just save that here as um, first UI. We're going over. Um, directory. So we have our first UI dot UI file, and if we're looking at it, um, we can see here's basically uh, we have a top level TK element. We set the geometry. And I mean, it still has height and width in there, but that's irrelevant. Um, then we have a nested notebook where we expand and fill both, and it's anchored to the northwest, so basically top left corner. And in there, we then have two tabs with ID tab first and tab second. And we can also, in theory, make it a translator, but if you wanted to. 
Um, and then within their frames, and then right at the bottom, we have another frame, which is anchored to southwest, so bottom left, and which only is allowed to fill sort of like uh, on the X. And I don't, maybe Ian can fill me in what differences between expand and fill. That's sort of like one distinction. I never really quite understood why, why I have an expand and a fill. It sort of like does the same thing to me. But maybe expand does both, and with fill, you can specify which direction, maybe. But anyway, it's probably in the documentation, I know. So maybe one of you guys um, who is listening in online can probably have a look uh, what's the difference between those two. Um, yeah, and here's our label and basing it in the C. So this is great. So we have basically our first interface and now what to do with it. So instead of being on the design tab where we are here, we can then switch to the code tab and we can then define which our main, what basically our main widget is. So you could in theory define, I think, multiple top level, excuse me, probably multiple top level ones, potentially. You can then um, def um, give your application a name so it generates an object. Let's call it my first app. It's not quite true. I know it's already my second, but um, we'll leave it at that. Um, we don't have a main menu in there. Um, we want to use um, theoretically a TTK style definitions. Oh, cool. We'll have a look at that in a minute. Maybe Ian can look at the difference and tell us then what the difference is on the stack overflow that David just posted. And um, yeah, so I can then go down here. Uh, yeah, no, I've, I've already looked at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it basically, um, um, <clears throat> Phil will fill an area, mm -hmm. but expand if, it, if you have filled the area and then you grab the parent widget and, and stretch it, then it will keep expanding. All oh, right, I see. Yeah. So, okay. So it's, expand relates to the parent. Oh, okay, widget. right. Yeah, you know, the, the, the frame. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and okay. Mm, fill makes is, sense. You, could, you could fill, yeah. but when you expand, it yeah. <laughs> that's interesting because that's a little counter to, to, to other uh, user interfaces, but okay. Cool. So um, we basically have now here a little um, code generated for us. Um, I'll just, we'll just do a new one, place it in here um, and save that. So is it a Python thing? All right. So what we see up here, I mean, first of all, it, has the shebang in there, so to automatically execute it as a Python 3 thing. Um, it uses pathlib um, to basically find its parent directory, so basically where the script is located in, and then creates a POSIX path, how to find the project user interface file that we are using. And then it basically just imports to Kinta and point Google. And if we're, and then uh, creates down here main method where it basically creates a my first application instance and then calls run on it. And in the run method, it's really just sort of like the main widget that we have. Um, it runs the main loop and that's it really. Um, the init method is uh, a little bit more interesting. So he can see how it generates the builder instance. Um, not particularly sort of like how I would do that. I don't like two uh, equal signs in a row in line, but that's okay. Um, different um, coding styles. Um, and yeah, so you basically they, um, add the resource path and then add that from 
the file and then by parsing it basically um, you can then retrieve the top level one which is if we're going back to our design thing the appearance we have the id is top level one so it basically retrieves the top level which is our main window and then we didn't define any callbacks yet but we can get there um, and yeah so if i drop down on the um, command line i can then basically run my first app and here is our first application up and running the user interface and doing that would have taken me uh, probably hours if not days if I would have done it by hand uh, not quite understanding how grid and pack and whatnot all these layout managers actually work on the tech end and always with baffling at least with the designer you can always actually play around with the properties and see how does it actually affect things and how does it actually look with the preview so that I found that really really helpful can you stretch in the bottom right corner can you, you stretch the dimensions of your uh, no I cannot so this is really just a preview and you can select the item I think but you can't actually change the geometry in the preview you mean that, Ian? Yeah, yeah, I went with the top level. Um, really no, it doesn't look it. like it. So you really go via geometry there yeah. uh, in order to change that. Cool. So we can also, in theory, um, add, for instance, a menu in there. So we want to have a top level menu. And that always sort of like, I found that always very confusing. So, okay, we have a top level menu. Uh, we put a menu in there. And then we put a sub menu in there. And this is actually the thing that shows. So the label, for instance, we could have file in there. And we want, for instance, oops. Uh, default and underline, we want to have the first character. So this was one thing which you don't see in here. Um, if a, Go on the preview you don't necessarily see the menu in the preview so you actually have to run things from mm -hmm. there then but that's okay that's not too bad um so if i go in the sub menu here so that's the file one um ah, there's another little thing that can be sometimes a little bit frustrating how the hell did it get that and you, oh yeah, by the way, there's no undo, so save and make sure that you <laughs> get an undo point from there. Um, system. So sometimes when you're actually trying to pull things down, you're actually scrolling through the combo boxes, which I just did. So I was scrolling through there, and then as you can see, so I'll make that a bit bigger. In my relief, it switched from default link to a relief so it pays using the scroll bars um, to avoid any funny behavior right um, what I actually wanted to change was I don't want the menu to be able to tear up oh, not tear off that's sort of like a functionality that I've never really used for anything um, I don't want to do tear off here so, and in the sub menu, we can then define basically a um, command um, where we can then give it, for instance, um, a label open. Um, and the accelerator, we want to use control plus O. Um, and like I said, it doesn't actually do anything. So um, and here in the callback thing, you can then, for instance, um, define a method name that you want to have, so simple. Um, you have the choice then whether just simple or also send the widget ID. 
I'm just usually sticking with um, simple and then have separate callbacks in this case for most of the cases. There might be other use case scenarios where you have lots and lots of labels um, in there and they should all be handled sort of like by the same callback, but you just don't want to have different uh, pen or different method method names for each one of them and um, kind of like make your object or your class Python wrapper class a little bit convoluted so you can also then have the approach of sending in the widget ID and then do the hand within the method itself rather than using separate methods. Okay, so if we run that now, we can see that we now have an open thing and control O. So that does something excellent. So if I save that and then generate the code again, um, just copy. We can see they have a little bit more now. So we're connecting the callbacks in this case, and we have this stage one callback, which is the on file open click. So for instance, I can output something in command line. And then we can run that and we'll see what happens. Move over. And so if I click on open, open sesame. Excellent. Now if I do control O, then nothing happens because as I said before, this text that's being displayed is actually not being translated in any, any sort of like key bindings, unfortunately. I just have to go quickly back and um, copy some paste there, copy some code there. Um, and I can then pop that in here and have control O and I've named it slightly different. Does it need to be uppercase O? Sorry? Does it need to be uppercase O? No, it's not. Okay, so For me, it's... It, so it, it's control. I don't want to do it control shift. Right. So, um, yeah. Look. It's, it's, so that's why it's lowercase. I mean, if I want to, we'll see. I, I, I'm just going to run it. And if I can run control off, oops. Takes one position, I've got two, we're given. Okay. Uh, why did it do that? Right. Try that again. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, okay. I'll have to sneak in my actual application and see what's happening there. Save for I I tried it now and I just didn't have any any parameter on if I'm file open click method. Yeah. And it just printed it. Oh. Okay. I don't know what the uh, like I had the self parameter but not a not the right. Okay. That worked for me. Yeah, I did save the file. Uh, okay, so uh, Luca yeah. um, had a suggestion, so I'll try doing that without. Um, okay, and yeah, uh, yeah, it well, still comes from one, one parameter. Yeah, one parameter. but it didn't. It didn't like the one before either when I had, but. You reckon it, it that it's actually a self. static method? Self should be mandatory, shouldn't it? Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, but there it's going to open this right? It's like it's using it as a static one. David said, saved file in editor. Yes, I did. Um, oh, okay.
Yes, it is. And it's safety as well, so. Mm -hmm. And it's a simple one too. Okay, um, I'm, I'll have to sneak over in my... Uh, um, i have a quick look what I did there. What happened to you when you first tried it? Just because when I just, I just replaced the pass uh, keyword, it was just print function that just worked instantly. Um, yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. And, and it didn't. It didn't work. No, exactly. So that's why I was a bit confused. Yeah. Um, because it was the code that it generated for me. Um, so. Okay, so I do have some. Oh, so I do have something in here for simple in here. And so come here. Sorry, folks, font is a bit small, I know. Um, oh, the skin. Yeah, I actually have self in there, so that's, that's a really good question. Now, um, what did I do different? Did do the call next. So that's fine, yeah. And then when I'm actually connecting them, I'm just binding them. And it didn't complain about that. Oh well. Ah, let's switch over to that one. <clears throat> Because in theory, that's actually, mm. huh? That's weird. Yeah, I must treat them really as, as as static ones. Is that is that a Takinta thing that it doesn't actually know object oriented programming? <laughs> okay, um, I'll it, it I'll do. A, itself, though, it be. I know. Um, I think the self in Python doesn't it, it just takes whatever the first parameter as the self. So there's no Yeah, but no but for convention it, right. it's just weird. Um, I mean we can just do that and see what happens, right? So that's actually the instance of my application. So it is basically itself. So event is actually incorrect, so it should actually be that. So calling it event is a little bit misleading. Um, but now I think there should be a second parameter. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing then, right? No, no. <laughs> Why did it win? <laughs> okay, we'll just ignore that. Right. Okay. Okay, so don't trust everything that you see. I mean, huh. Why does it have self in there now? Okay, I'll, I'll give up. <laughs> Sorry. I might have to look at the video again, what I've done wrong. But anyway, we have it working now, and that's the main thing, really. David's got event equal none. Oh, yes. 
Good point. Yes, yes. That was it. Yeah, I remember that it, I had that problem before. I put event and I didn't like an event equals none. Yes, good point. Um, because it may or may not provide you with something depending on whatever widget it is. Not all of them actually will provide you with something. That's true. Okay, sorry. Apologies for that, folks. Right, okay. Well, how do we say that? We learn together. Um, cool, and now it works actually, yeah. Cool. All right. Okay, um, we can then, for instance, extend. We'll add something to it eventually, don't worry. Um, so we'll add another command. In this case, um, we'll call it close in the line net. <clears throat> um, and I mean, theoretically, you don't have to regenerate all the call code all the time because it's not unfortunately a really round trip application where it looks at your code. It's really okay, here's code generated, now do with it whatever you want to. So what I'm doing is rather than um, copy pasting the code, I'm actually just filling in um, a little bit of stubby code myself. Um, so this is then for closing. I need to do another sneak preview of what I actually did yeah, here. Yeah, Yeah, I know. It, I haven't changed the editor, so it doesn't do that. Um, I'll close. It's a quit. Cool. But, um, so we have our main window. We're basically just calling quit on that then. So if we run this one then, close, outputs close and it also exits. So cool, that's working. Um, if we wanted to um, use something for opening files and whatnot, um, we'll have to um, go here. So we have, um, we can use um, ask open file. So there's a file dialog in Tekinta which we can use. So for instance, we put that up here. And then I'll just grab it. So you can define basically a tuple or a tuple of tuples. Um, so basically, in the name. Or the type file type and then the extension is basically I presume it's a glob that's being used there and then you can call the ask open file name there's also ask save file name as well um, we want to give it a title um, open text file um, we use the current directory sort of like input and then we output on the console, whatever we've actually selected in there. Get rid of that now. All right, let's run that. And we click then of open, go, cool. then we can select basically a file. Um, examples. Oh, here's a text file. Go! Cool. And you can see down here, this is the path that it got returned of the file that we selected. And then we could in here do something with that. Oh, 
So that's sort of like for um, doing a little application where we can also interact uh, with the system. We can, of course, do all kinds of other things. So Canvas for drawing stuff, um, you know, the progress bar and other things. Um, actually, a size grip would be not a bad thing to have in the bottom. So I will see whether we can actually do that. Site grip, um, layout, anchor, south, east, at the bottom. So if we run that. Oh. So at least now we know that there's actually something that we can grip in order to um, expand the user interface. Um, right. Um, another thing, I'll actually show that from the other application that I've done over there. Um, pull it over. It's a little application um, that I've worked or try sort of like getting the code from a colleague and turning that into a slightly nicer user interface. So this is um, just a little view for hyperspectral imaging um, data. And um, basically loads a couple of files and displays things then. Um, and then sort of like here you can see three tabs with some info, with a text field basically, some options where I have um, multiple um, checkboxes in there. And this image, the way that I'm displaying that, that is actually from the Pillow Library. They actually have a TK image, um, a photo image that you can actually then embed in there, just with the usual thing. And that's sort of like one of the things where you don't have an easy to drag and drop and modify widget then because it's not part of Tekinda, but you would need to have um, Sort of like then uh, a custom sort of like plugin that you would have to develop for it. But I'm actually thinking of maybe adding that at some stage because it would be nice to have it just as a drag and drop thing. At the bottom, you can see sort of like some label with some info about um, the dimensions of the hyperspectral image, um, the channels that are used to basically generate this um, fake RGB image behind the scenes. So you can then basically just slide around and sort of like change things on the fly. Make it a bit trippy. Um, yeah, and then basically regenerates with NumPy basically behind the scenes um, a fake RGB image and then displays it immediately as a new image. And it's actually relatively zippy, I have to say. Um, I mean, um, I'm actually changing the channel from each time the scale down here. Notif uh, notices that there's a change. It basically triggers a change in what hyperspectral image or channels are being used, creates a new image, and displays it more surprisingly fast, I found, <clears throat> when you actually sort of like go through here. And you can also go stepwise through it or not, but yeah. And then, yeah, so there's sort of like here yeah, the open things that you can do in there. You can export an image as well, where then basically just um, use Pillow for saving that image then, and um, save that for instances. <clears throat> see whether it actually appended the... Um, it appended the extension, and then, yeah, so you can see uh, what you see is also what you get then. Um, and you can do, for instance, other things with that if you just want to take a screenshot of that thing. Ooh, so that's that. Um, with the Pi Google Designer, it um, comes with quite a large variety of examples. So if you are wanting to look into something, how to do something, 
this is probably the way to go. Um, pretty, well, for instance, here um, we have a demo um, UI, and that's probably, I wonder whether they're using, so that's just using the label for displaying it. Um, so if we are, for instance, um, Activate that here. Um, hi, Google Designer examples where I might. That's a static image. So if I run demo app, so you can see that it's displaying the this particular static image here. And if we're loading, if we are loading the app in the kind of designer, UI, I'm just wondering if we do this. Oh yeah, actually that's another thing. When you're doing a lot of things in the designer, you at least my X windows likes to go a bit nuts for a while after you close it. So it must be doing something with the keyboard input or whatever refreshing input where it can take a while before anything happens. So that was another little um, odd thing we have. But, um, okay, looking at what we have here, so we have Two labels, so we have uh, a frame um, where we have, okay, expand on both, okay. We have a label on top with just some text and then underneath another label where we have the image then being displayed. So you can basically specify if it's in the same directory you can then specify other images that you can automatically display. Um, so you can here select things that you want to have displayed. Or if you do it dynamically, you can also then do it at runtime as well and then just sort of like resize whatever you're displaying. Um, okay. What else do we So the top level menu, it might be a slightly um, more advanced menu. I have to wait for X windows to come down again. So your mileage may vary, so you might Sometimes my X-Windows behaves a bit funny, um, may behave better under your system. Um, <laughs> might be easier if I just um, run the examples. Anyway, so if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, this is sort of like more or less, let's say, the end of my presentation. Um, since I'm not really a master of um, my GUI yet. I'm just going to, yep. normally you've got like grid and pack. Yes. So, ways. Yeah. yeah. If you go back to like your main original design, 
So that was using pack. Can you if you put a grid in there and then put a can you put a button in one square and make it a grid? Or? Yeah, we can screw it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So we can go in the frame that we have in one of the tabs. So it has this one, for instance. Um, then, for instance, layout, we want to use um, grid. Um, and then we can, for instance, what? Just start throwing buttons in there or something. Label. So that's our grid. Oh, you have rows um, and columns. Yep, so you have rows and columns in there. And then if we have a button, actually we'll want to have it row zero, column one. Yeah, not there. This one. <laughs> oh, and it's hanging. Huh? Excellent. I managed to screw up the editor. <laughs> so much about your suggestion for doing a grid, Ian. Yeah. Um, I don't want to use grids because I... It's probably because I didn't define um, how many columns and rows it should have. So it doesn't zero, like zero. that. Um, but I can still save it funnily enough. Um, so, I mean, what I can do is I'm going to close that. See yeah. what the code has to say. Yes, it what it generates. A little bit cracked out there. Um, so it's a frame. I'm always a bit confused with the grid where it applies to. Does it apply to itself or does it apply to the, to the parent? It should, it should apply to itself, right? Uh, it, and its children, because you can then propagate. Uh, so that's at least. The grid is oh, it's part of the frame. Is that part? Yeah. Inside the frame, you put a grid. Yes. And then inside the grid, you put, I put two a, a label and a button in there. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, I'll, I'll I'll put it back to what it wanted, which was zero and one. I mean, you can just I can just run it. Um, see what it does there. So I have label and button there. So if I switch, do a switch a rule, it does that. Okay, so that works. Let's try opening that again and see where that re recovers from that. Yeah, okay. I think it didn't, maybe it didn't like it that I put it on itself, that I had two elements on the same thing, maybe. So that it somehow stuffed it up. Anyway, so I could then add, I mean, with the. And then look at adding another label, and another button. In this case, I am column first, and then the row. Okay, that might be the better approach. Have you played with the sticky thing? Um, like with that sticky? Um, no, I haven't. Let's just try clicking one square to the right, east. So for the button? Yeah, the button might yep. shift. Right? Um, no, I think because it doesn't... I thought it'd shift across to the right hand side. So I'll frame. have to have a look what... So 
So I have don't I have to do frame that it does sticky there as well? Hmm. Uh, theoretically, it should have sort of like stretched across, right? No, I thought it should jump to the or right. Or jump to the right. Yeah. But we didn't, did we define? Um, did we say what the maximum? Because there's other things where you can say, uh, mm. like span, the button span. Yes, um, that's so many positions. this row span or column span you can then define. Yeah. But um, so if we have, it doesn't change anything because there's no. Well, Idea. Maybe it's because the text inside the button is less than you know wanting to wrap or go out. If you put button two was a big long story, then it wouldn't all fit in the button, so that would span over. And it starts stretching. Yep. So that's stretched. So if I, I'll just change the sticky in that one back to center and then the sticky will do that over there all right okay so it does work it's just not worth uh, we didn't notice it because it was the same width okay if you make good. it the whole row then does yeah. that button one strip the same width as button you mean like two? this yes yeah. that was also a little bit confusing how because in, when i click on something it doesn't stick so you have to sort of like shift select in the area that it's sticking to <laughs> yeah that wasn't the most yeah intuitive one it took me a while just by accident where i actually <laughs> um figured out like so, hey i just changed something but yeah so if we actually one thing is um is the padding and applying Where can I actually apply within a grid how much the padding is between a cell, between the cells? Can I do that? Yeah, isn't that about pad X, pad Y? Put a 10 in each one of those. This one here? Maybe a 20. But that's just the outside of the frame where I have... Oh, that's a grid. No, no. no, that's the frame with a grid as manager. Yeah. So that's the thing that I had my jackpot couldn't quite figure out because I then basically defined it for each element itself. Hey, you have a padding of 10, 10, 10, 10 or whatnot um, in order to do that. Um, oh, yeah. hold on. Maybe it's this one here. Yeah, that's, that's a bit better. Okay, cool. So that's down here with the rows. Okay. But, um, oh, oh, right. Okay, so I can select. Okay, oh, I get it. Okay, so here you can select what you see underneath for what. Um, row and column you want to do things slightly confusing <laughs> you clicking so you we have a two by two grid and you click in the center of a cell and you see four smaller squares ignore those but if we want to do it for all um cells we can do that looks of it interesting enough that button looks a bit different now it must be it's now with the stretching there so if i make that sticky all right okay so for some reason it changes things a little bit oh well I think that's based probably where you then spent the next three years trying to make the user interface look consistent, trying to figure out why is that slightly different. But anyway, 
Um, yes, so you can do a grid as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what does the code look like? You generate the code. Is it no button to label? You know, button. Knowing, knowing, you is mean with it? callbacks? Yeah, does it auto generate callbacks? No, you actually have to. So when you're going on, um, that's actually a good question. With buttons. I'm pretty sure with one of the other ones, you know, I know with the, so the GTK. If you go on the button, yeah. you can see the callback again. So you actually have to select. Oh, right. You have to. You have to basically give it a name, sort of like basically on button one click. Okay, okay, yeah. And then we can have um, on button two click. We should save that. Um, now that. And if we generate the code, so then you can see that we. And then it puts basically here we have our button one. And then down here, a button to click, and then you can fill things again. Um, like you said, because now, let's say we now want to add a bunch of functionality, a functionality to this, and then we later want to change the layout. Yeah. And we have to kind of do some work to actually merge those changes together. Yeah. So if you if you are wanting to change the layout or not, that's why it's so important that you have IDs uh, that you can retrieve those elements, and that you sort of like keep your um, callback names the same and then it doesn't matter because then whatever the layout is doesn't matter because you're pulling it in recreating the user interface nice. and you're just retrieving sort of like like um, like with the main so I'm just gonna go here. yeah right because you could just delete all of those methods and just paste yeah so you basically yeah exactly so you can just write it yourself you don't actually have to do anything so you can just so it's basically what I've done in the designer, I just put in the callback names and actually didn't bother. I didn't even know it was generating those stubs initially. I thought, I was, oh, okay, I have to write a stub for it and it does that. And then um, you can basically, by naming your elements and have meaningful names to it, you can then just retrieve whatever and then do some, something with it. And then, for instance, here, like with the main window which we're retrieving, we can then bind um, the shortcuts that we want to actually use from the menu. It would, be, it would be cool to have all of your functionality in a separate Python file, and then this would just import that. So yeah, you um, use the same file again and again. Well, the, th the thing is, I mean, you can have, I mean, it's, it's a good way of actually separating out um, the user interface logic and whatever does your backend stuff. So you can have another class that does the heavy lifting of things and whatnot. Um, so you can, for instance, then reuse it in a command line application, for instance, rather than having a user interface. And it just supplies things to it. And then accordingly, you can then just create an instance in this application in it, um, done the in it method, and then you have that instance. And then basically in those callbacks, you use that instance to do stuff with, for instance, opening a file. Oh, here's the file, compute something. And then do other things. So yes, mm -hmm. um, I mean it's always a problem um, when you're using like a user interface builder like that that you chuck in your logic in there, mm -hmm. and then it becomes quite clunky sometimes. And when you're trying to rearrange things, that can be really ugly. Mm -hmm. That's why I normally prefer right as sort of like going the other way. I have first my logic, my backend stuff, and then actually build the user interface on top after I know everything that needs to be done right. and then fit that on top. And so I basically just call, have relatively lightweight calls and the application doesn't hold everything in that sense. It's done somewhere else. But yeah, with Tekinta, I went for once the other way around. Okay, let's try and build a user interface first and see what we can do with that. Um, and I mean, if you have a very small user interface, I think and if the point is that you're not actually wanting to separate it out because you want to use it in the backend application, then it seems like a big overhead. It's always um, a discussion that you have to sort of like hold with yourself. Is it worth my time, this software engineering, that I do it as a separate class mm -hmm. in order to do things and then communicate with it and then queue updates in the user interface properly and all these things? Or do I just plug it in there and go with that and we can always 
later on revisit it if we have to change things or we know it's actually going somewhere then we can always refactor things and then we look at things again and then incorporate feedback that we're getting from users like your user interface sucks yeah i know <laughs> i'm only doing that for the last 30 years but no um, can, can you go back to the designer again um, yep you know how you've got uh, uh, do you want to see the design, the design. Yep. yeah um, yeah, you've got the TTK, which is preferred because that can yep. be styled and yep. like that. What, what buttons are there if you just click on the TK? So, t so pretty much the same. It's well, it has TTK has a little bit more in there. Yeah. Um, I thought it was the other way around. I thought in yeah. in yeah. some other things that had yeah. So scroll okay. Yeah. So. It had, yeah. So it had, a scroll it has sort of like labeled things in there as well, so labeled scale, and I think TK only has a scale yeah. rather than a labeled scale, so that's basically something together. But I first tried that, and actually, I got <laughs> then accessing values in TK didn't work for the label scale because it wasn't exposing the same options as the scale so I had to actually go back and separating things out have to have a separate label and a separate scale so I could basically get and set my min max for the scale because that was changing yeah. at runtime and yeah so I had problems with the C get so that I can conf it's like what was it configure get or something so you can see what the for instance for a scale of the two from is and then with configure you can then call okay so update the two and update the from and so on and then to kinta like you can't have a python string you've got a to kinta has its own variable as a string or something um yes yeah, so in order to communicate for instance with the check button or the scale you can define um so you can define text as so you can define variables so for instance uh, what do we put in here let's let, let's put another scale and uh, the variable has to be defined yes in TTK's understanding of the variable yeah yes. however um, so basically the variable there which is a Tekinta object where you communicate basically with the widget you can set a value and retrieve the current value basically so with a scale you would get the current position and set it however with check buttons it didn't seem to work so i set a true and false so you can also then have true and false in there and it just wouldn't update it so i had to actually invoke it if things were different so i'm not quite sure whether it's just because i'm doing it wrong but i've seen I've been looking at other people's code and say, oh, this is how you do it. Yeah, that's what I'm doing, and it doesn't. So, no idea. But um, I'm not particular to Kinder. Kinder is a thing, a programming language called TCL. TCL, TK, yeah. Okay. So, the which TCL, is ancient. What? Which is ancient. Yeah, well, he's done. So, TCL's definition of, of what a variable is, like a string or an individual or mm -hmm. something like that. That'll be what is used in Tekinta, is it? I think so, and that's sort of like that's why you have these wrapper variables, uh, and that probably does things behind the scenes to to get to it or not. Yeah. And yeah, so you can here, for instance, um, define what type it is, whether a string, int, double, yeah. or boolean. Okay. And for instance, for a check button, I use boolean. Um, so if I, I mean, for the scale. Yeah, you can see I was typing and now I have scale RAF <laughs> underscore rather than scale underscore bar. So you, you, you see how you actually have to chain, wait for the thing to uh, finish its job. So it's trying to refresh between characters. Hmm? Yeah, it depends on how quickly you're typing. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're 
typing rate per minute is dropping below a certain number, <laughs> it starts refreshing. So it better be a um, touch typer. Um, so we we'll drop in a check button. Um, we want to have a variable colon, um, and we have our off value, which is false, and our on value, which is true. Okay. So if we go on code and then generate. So you can see, uh, so this has changed. So it basically initializes the two variables that I've defined in the designer interface, and then it imports these. So it's really just scale bar so it has the instance properly defined in the dunder init method and then it imports these variables so the equals none you don't actually have to do that you can just do that and um, you don't need to specify them necessarily either so you can drop that and it just imports all of the variables that are in there but you may or may not want to do all of them because only some of them may be used and whatnot. So you can have a level of control over that as well. So we could, for instance, then try... Uh, print, print self scale underscore bar. Yes, print... Oops. Okay. I just need to... So, first button, so it says none. I probably didn't save the user interface. So you can see the little star up in there. So that's why I didn't get that. So, which is uh, absolutely correct because it hasn't changed anything. Let me try that again. And now we actually have our two elements. So you can see there's a pi bar zero. I'm going to close that and then go back in there. So I think I'm going to do something funny with my... Oh. From... Oh. Notice the underscore in the from parameter. 255. Seven. And with the button two, we'll output check button one then. So you can see that it actually has two different variables that it's using behind the scene. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually the names for those variables that are used internally, but probably by Tekinta, oh, TK, I presume. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, Okay. 
So I think it's just a git. So I can Theoretically. <laughs> so yeah, one, two, three. And faults. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So yeah. if I do it through the user interface, it was working. So but then, for instance, change things and then output things. So accessing it was fine. When I was trying to initialize the user interface through the variable, it didn't do. I mean, it'll be interesting to see whether this now works and calls me a liar. Um, so if I now have, just try and set. Um, Ha, ah, now it's working. <laughs> Far out. I couldn't get that to work. Okay. Scale might work. Um, I want to see whether it works with the stupid check button. So, you're setting the default power on. Yeah. And launch. Yeah. See? Check button doesn't work. Does it not? What if you put, say, a zero instead of So if I, because if I now output with the second button what the value is, it says it's true, but it's not updating the uh, widget. Uh, okay. So if I then do that, and then stays true, that's the thing that was driving me batty, yeah. because, yeah, it was working with the scale that I could change it, but the check button wasn't doing it. So I'm not sure whether that's a problem with, to Kinta itself that this is a bug or whatever or whether because I mean I've seen with other um, approaches that they were actually rather than using a boolean variable they were using an integer variable and then setting zero and one for changing these things so I'm not sure whether that will then work better. I've, I've had them where I don't know which particular you know it could be GTK. Mm. I go through all the setup and then I have to fire a dummy like, yeah. Like you maybe if you just write it twice. No. Well, put the command in twice. What I. Yeah. What or, I was or, or doing is, I true. think if self. Um, get is not the same as oh, I think there was a way of uh, I was checking then uh, I was looking at the button. What is your state? Yeah. Cool. If not. Whatever that was, I was then doing self. I mean, I had to retrieve the button, of course, and whatnot, and then self button dot invoke, yeah. which basically simulates a click. Yeah, yeah. That's and therefore, it had the same value. <laughs> so, and therefore, that was the only way how I could sort of like, okay, if, if the value that I want to have and the button's value are currently different then just simulate a click here, please, so that we have the same and then we can yeah. start get going. But, but it's a case of it's launched, but it hasn't refreshed, isn't it? There is... Yeah, but the scale so, works. Well, the scale setting it there automatically yeah. is, is yeah. at the 12th position rather than in the center. Yeah. That is the thing that was... It worked for that. That it worked for I couldn't it. understand. So if... I mean, what, yeah... What if you put a, a false and then a true? So it forces two commands, one after another. Right. So first false and then true. Yeah, no. but, but I thought there was also a thing where you... Um, Doesn't change anything, unfortunately. I mean, I can... I thought there was actually a, a thing where you... You know, you, you force a refresh. Of a particular button or no, from no. a variable. There, oh. there is actually a, something that refreshes the Takinta screen. Oh, right. Um, um, to Google, to, oh, yeah. Hey, Jim says. I've lost audio. Oh, okay. Yep, that's all right. Um, the video will be online later on the week, Jim. Um, if you want to uh, watch it. Cool. Glad to help a little bit. One 
anything else he can last to reveal. Did anyone else? Sam's asking question here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the... That's a really good question. Um, so it we... doesn't have to be called cool event. It just means that the callback, as well as supplying self, supplies some, some other information. Yes. You know? So and you can actually add. You could have your callback could pass other things if you so, want. To. Sam, so we look here for, for button one. We have a simple callback. If we change that to send widget ID, save that, um, and then go where we're pressing on the first button. Um, It's called event, I know, but we ignore it for the time being, whatever it's called. So if I run that again, press on the button, then we see button one and then the value of our scales so button one is basically the event that got sent, or in this case, it's just the event ID or the widget ID. So you could react to it um, if you had, for instance, like 37 buttons in there. But they all have a different ID, and you can just have one callback for all 37 buttons. And within that method, you use the widget ID. I mean, I should probably not call it event equals zero, but um, uh, we call it maybe widget ID. Makes more sense. Um, whatever it is. Just run it again. Press on it. So, code makes a little bit more sense. Um, so, this, yeah, I mean, I'm actually, yeah, sorry that I call it event. Um, there's two things why <laughs> it is the case. That's interesting. For the button, it actually calls a widget ID. Um, if I had it on the menu, I thought it had it called it. So it, it calls it differently depending on what it is. So on the button, it was using widget ID. On the menu, it's using item ID. Not to make it confusing. Um, you should be able to do something like print widget ID. Yeah, that's what I did. That's what I was outputting. I was outputting button one. Oh. So it's really just a, a string. Taking the label. It's, it's the ID. Oh, okay. That is defined. So in, in um, yeah, okay. In the so button one, so our ID is button one. Yeah. So if I change that, my super cool button, yeah, there we go, reverse typing. Um, <laughs> we'll use that. So if I have that in there and then click the button. Yeah. And we can see it's sort of my super cool not to. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yes, there, there, are, there are some some quirks in the tool, but um, nonetheless, it's still for slotting things together um, and then naming things. It it does help a little bit, especially sort of like um, rather than having spaghetti code and having that somehow nested. Um, it's sometimes easier seeing it in a tree, how the nesting actually works. And you can also then see here what um, row and column that is. So you know, oh, in this one, we actually have grid rather than pack. Um, that helps a little bit finding things, um, how the layout works. And the other thing is, 
by clicking on the uh, uh, widget itself, it jumps in the tree. So it makes it actually easier finding things and then changing things rather than figuring out, oh, sorry, which which was, what was the idea of that thing again? What's it named? And then following through code of, of larger ones. Okay, so Sam, does that answer the question, hopefully? We just named it event. I know it's actually not the best name. You should also be able to pass, um, let's say, when you go into a method, you might want to pass some data to that method mm -hmm. um, because you're going to use it to do, you know, when you process that method, you, you need some data. Mm -hmm. So, so you should so be able a payload. To what? A payload that you're sending with it. Yeah, so, so you, it doesn't have to relate anything at all to the widget. Mm -hmm. You could pass uh, math.py. Yeah. And, and so pi would get passed to the, as, as data. How do you define that? You just keep adding to the list. <laughs> you, know, you just put a comma. And add right, and, um, but I mean, with the user, uh, so like with the Pi Google design, I don't think so that you can do that yeah. because it only offers you as a callback the simple or with send the widget ID. Yeah, have a, have a look at the um, uh, what is it, the uh, XML mm -hmm. and see what So this is a specific Pi Google thing, sort of like where it knows what to send. Yeah. So this is not, it's, it's a thing specific to that particular library. It basically really only offers you these two things. Uh, so if you want to do other things, then you probably have to add the button yourself, I mm. think, and then do funkier things with it if you need more flexibility for sending sort of like other yeah. things of data. Yeah, it's quite, when you, well, I don't know whether the, the designer for, what is it, GTK? Blade. Designer? Blade, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know whether I've, I've tried it there, but, but if you're mm. hard coding GTK, yeah. then you can you can have pass all sorts of things mm. through to the, to the method. Yeah. Then it saves you having to have, um, you know, otherwise you've got to say self dot, you yeah. know, math dot pi equals yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever, you know. Um, it, yeah. So rather than have all these self mm. things floating mm. around yeah. just pass to the method use it yeah and the i mean um i guess that's sort of like one thing where you have to weigh the up pros and cons do you want to do for these things do you want to use the designer yeah. or if you need that then you do it by hand sort of like in the init method and actually create those widgets yourself that you can have more flexibility in, um, in yeah. sending additional stuff but still, the bulk of your of your user interface you can probably still build within the designer, and then you know, okay, this particular frame, name it. Within this frame, I do all these things in my hand. But then your initialization method is still way shorter than it would have been if you actually have to do everything yourself, yeah. just based on them. It was also, I don't know which one it was with, but. See, you can't actually produce the equivalent longhand to Kinder code, can you? You go, you know, run the builder and it happens, and you don't... Oh, you, you mean outputting the, whatever the Tekinta code is? What? Outputting the Tekinta code? Yeah, if, I mean, if you run a right at longhand... <laughs> you mean spaghetti code? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm pretty sure one of these I could actually produce I knew what Builder was doing. You know, I mm -hmm. could actually output the you know, Builder was going, you know, <clears throat> all the commands it was issuing to Tekinta. 
Good question. Um, so with the code generation, see, it's sort of, and this is the way to, oh, what's all that? So if you, instead of yeah. an application where you actually load in your PyGoogle UI yeah. in there, you can also just go on code script, generate, yeah. and yeah. there basically it does everything Long in the Tekinta. Yeah spaghetti code if you really want to have it so yes you can do that and then you see i mean if you just need something specific figuring out how to how this works yeah. and you can just okay add this thingy initialize it and do something with it and then use it in your so, so just um where, where, where were we trying to add uh, a label? i'll co copy that to um uh, no, I'm just thinking when it added, but uh, it adds the button. We get a command equal cell phone button click. I thought that command equal cell phone button click. I thought that's where you could sort of put a comma and put. Sorry, when my you data. Uh, line 23. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we're with command. So you. I thought after that you just sort of did a comma and then you put yeah, pi or something like that. And it passed things. As far as I know, it complains. I mean, yeah. if you use option or sort of like properties that are not named or properties that are not known, it complains about it. Maybe it's just GTK that lets you do these things. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember which one. Yeah. I think it was GTK where you were um, yeah. transmitting other things alongside, so you didn't have to do that then in the method and doing a check there. Okay. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's um. Yeah. Well, certainly saves a bit of typing in. Yeah. I mean, it takes a little bit of get getting used to it, but. Um, Having the live preview, I found yeah. probably the most beneficial, really, because if you have this spaghetti code here in the background and you think, why is this not displaying the way it's supposed to display? And it's like, it's really hard to figure out with that code. So it's a matter of seeing when you yep. change in real yep. time. Yeah, exactly. Seeing time. when you change something, like when I initially did sort of like, oh, I um, when I put the kind of like the status bar down and it was stuffing things up and I said, oh yeah, okay. Of course it doesn't work because I used the wrong parameters. Is there any way to take an existing uh, TK layout and kind of import it into the <laughs> um, I don't think so that it's a round trip tool. Mm -hmm. It's a design, it's sort of like a one way thing. Yeah. It yeah. generates something for you that you can use. Yeah. Um, I know if, um, Back in the days um, when I was try looking at these things, when I was building swing interfaces in Java, there were actually some tools that were doing round trip. So they actually analyzed the code that you were writing and were actually re-importing that and doing that as well. But they could sometimes choke on your stuff as well. And, not. and of course, the next round trip changes then the code that you had written and it was no longer quite the same. So I stopped using those. Even though the functionality was the same, but then it figured out what you were doing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Inco basically incorporated into its own meta sort of like layout and then regurgitated so it in its own form. It's not just looking backward for the, for the layout. No, TK doesn't use XML at all. This no. is really Pi Google, yeah. and it's simply because it's um, inspired by by GTK and Glide. Glide uses XML as well. Pi QT uses XML as well. So just stuck with that as well, using XML. And then you could, in theory, also just um, because the nesting in XML works quite well, you can then just grab fragments mm -hmm. and copy paste them into other things yeah. or if you have, you can kind of like design a new sub thingy, a new tab in the designer, grab the thing and slot it in into your main XML file then, yeah. and then just indentation and 
boot it up and you have a new tab in there without having to go back to your original design. You just design that particular sort of like part, subtree and then you go with that. Yeah. It wasn't good for, for, for that. You could try um, <laughs> doing a root dot update when it launches. So after setting the variable, Ian is suggesting to do a root dot update. Let's see whether that's going to root me. Um, I know about root, where we just self got updated. Uh, uh, root, that, that's my main window. Because yeah. one thing when you're actually looking for things is most people in Tikinta don't write object oriented code. So whenever you're finding something, it doesn't really apply. <laughs> um, and then you say update, right? Yeah, try it. Actually, I'm, one thing that irks me, I still haven't set a twinkle. Um, um, let's see. Should I do something? <laughs> okay, I'll do um, yeah, I mean, it's the only thing. Oh, yeah, I mean, what we could try rather than trying boolean and false, we can try zero and one, and make it end. Um, and then in here, use one. Haha. Mm, so that's a bug with a with a boolean variable. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it works with the integer variable, but not with a boolean variable. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. I learned something tonight. <laughs> can um, the checkbox can be undecided until you've decided whether it's true or false. Yes, so there's so a really th there's a true. third state. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, but in this case, it is actually there's a defined state, yeah. and it doesn't do anything. Okay. Oh well, there's one more. Cool. One that's one cool. one mystery solved. Don't use boolean variable, even <laughs> though it's a boolean. That's okay. Cool. Okay. You can delete my update. <laughs> ah, yeah, it's all right. Uh, maybe I no, it's already. Maybe I need that. You know. <laughs> Could very well be. So without your update, no, no, okay, I don't need it. Cool. Okay, so we can remove that update then as well. Okay. Uh, could it be something like the true and false? Right? Yeah, so I'm Tequinta not. It doesn't accept an uppercase T for true. It wants. Possibly. I mean, we can try something else because the on off value might be just a string, like you say. So if we are um, off value, we're using false, then we're using true, and we're using a string. Right? Yeah. Um, and then we're going. Um, and using true here. And that works too. It's the boolean that it doesn't like. Yes. But I'm dead. So what have you tried? You've tried zero and one, you've tried true and false with capital letters. The boolean. Yeah. You tried true and false with lowercase? I haven't. I mean it's possible that this is an old fashioned way of boolings. All right. Okay. Sure all right. That's all good. Yeah. Thanks for coming. I'll, uh, I saw there was a new one on Monday. Next month. Yeah. Next month. Yeah. Next month. On Monday. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Nice Thanks for coming. Yeah. 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 Seeing you. Bye. Cheers. Yes. Yeah. What format is the code in the first UI UI code? Um, so you mean this one here, Nick?
So this is just XML, um, and it is, I would say, um, my Google specific XML. So all these types of tags that you have an object with what class and whatnot, that this is specific to Pi Google. Um, but take it with a grain of salt, I actually haven't looked into it. It's just my gut feeling because each um, user interface um, application that uses some form of way of storing things, if they use XML, then they come up with their own sort of like format usually, but I'm not sure whether that's um, a particular thing. But we can do an extensive um, internet search. Um, XML. I mean, it's possible that there's actually a standard. doesn't say specifically that it is anything. Um, oh, that disappeared. So it probably, since it's inspired by Glade, that it's using the same format, or very similar at least. Is my feeling. And I mean, it will probably be a bit different because GTK uses different properties and whatnot. But at least from the looks of like, yeah, you have an object, class and ID, and then there has properties, they have children, and there's other things with the nesting in there. Um, I'm not sure. Whether there's actually a specification somewhere. Next step, thank you. Probably something similar to XML. It is XML. Yeah, it is XML. It's just with custom tags and whatnot. I mean, it's just the nesting and whatnot. So it is XML. Um, as you can see on top, version 1 and UTF-8 encoded. But the type, so that there is no schema attached to it or old-fashioned like a DTD. So it is, I think, based on the GTK specifications on how to um, specify things. Cool. Any more questions? Ian is good? Yeah, I'm good. Anyone from the online audience who has a question? Oh, yeah. There's another question. Could you please briefly call, explain the callback call method part that was used in the code as builder.connect and it's called callbacks right itself. Cool. So, for instance, where we have our button here, where we name a button one click, right? Um, and then in our code, 
we then have on button click here. So, um, connect callbacks. Um, so, for instance, if we misspell this here, try and start it up. Then it complains that there's a missing callback of that name. So it might, with the connecting, um, I'm not sure whether that's just, um, it's, I'm not quite sure how the Tekinta, so we have, I think the Tekinta things um, have basically these bind um, calls. And what this connect callback will do is it, on the widget, it will call a bind with whatever in the goes in here. I'm not 100% sure what goes in there, but it will then point to the relevant method that is defined within your um, class here. So if we change that and back again, um, we'll find everything again. Um, Sam is typing. Ian, do you remember how Tekinta was defining callbacks on buttons? Uh, you can give it any name you like, but on, on button click, sort of thing. Yeah. No, it's just how you actually bind them. Okay, I'm not quite sure why it's button one in that example. Find the oh, there. find one that could be a left click. Um, right. What do we have? Right, so you can have different event modifiers, event types. You have button. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated <laughs> just for a quick read. Um, it might be maybe something. I'll oh, just maybe post it in the chat here. Maybe something to read up on um, how the binding actually works. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Sam, so I have the chat here as well. Thanks. Um, 
it, it is a little bit like a no-code environment. Um, the point is that uh, the point is that developing a user interface by hand is actually quite tedious and annoying. So a user interface designer like that can actually help you quickly prototype a user interface. So you can, for instance, use that um, if you want to work together with a client. It's, you can easily create then screenshots and whatnot. Is this what you want? These are kind of like a bit like wireframes, but you can use these mockups then also um, to actually generate wrapper code where you then fill in your actual code. So the point is that it's not, while it's no code for the GUI side of things, so that layout and everything works, there's still a code option involved where you then actually fill in actual logic in there that does stuff. So what happens when I click on the button? Yes, it calls a callback method, but what happens with that? Do, am I doing something? Am I open, uh, allowing the user to open a file or am I saving a file? So these things actually then go in those callback methods in there. But the point is to reduce the boilerplate code that you have to write in order to create the user interface so that's all shifted and offloaded um, into the Pi Google XML and Builder class. So if, if we go back to um, the code, so oops, this, these few lines are our init method. It just loads in the XML file and recreates basically all the widgets and whatnot from the XML and creates your user interface. If we look at the code strip, code script, that does everything by hand. So you can see, despite us only having like a few elements on there, like two tabs and a notebook, um, two buttons, two labels in one of the um, tabs, and then a bottom sort of like label and grip. This is the code that, in the menu, this is the code that you need in order to recreate that. And all this sort of like boilerplate code goes, goes in, your, um, in your sort of like code as well. And by moving sort of like the user interface out into an XML file, then you can always change things there around. It doesn't change your code in your actual sort of like source file here. It stays in an XML file, and you're just retrieving then particular items via their ID and do something with it if you have to, and then do something with that. For instance, you can you don't have to find the callbacks through the user interface. You can just do it yourself. Um, so you don't have to fill in callbacks in the in the designer and then automatically bind them. You can just retrieve a button and then do the bind yourself. For instance. So it's about removing all this code and then have something just like that and the rest are sort of like done automatically. But you should be able to work at that level. You don't need to go back to that. Right, code. No, I mean, curiosity. yeah, I mean, you really don't need to write that really low-level Tekinto code in order to generate um, user interface. It's really for figuring out what actually happens down there if you actually need to, for instance, if you have a legacy application where you need to figure out, okay, I need to create a new tab with some buttons in there, then you could use the, um, the designer here. Okay, cool. This is what it should be. Generate me the code so I can copy-paste that code into that legacy application, for instance, and then it Hopefully works. <laughs> but if you have an application that you're building from scratch, I wouldn't actually bother with the low level code, just use the XML and that's it. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you can both check in into version control, both as text files, and you can see changes between them.
All right, cool. In that case, yeah. if there are no more questions, thanks everyone for coming tonight. I'll post in meetup.com once uh, the video is being processed and whatnot. Uh, might take a couple of days. Um, a bit busy at the moment. Um, but yeah, so hopefully you found it useful. I definitely found it useful for as a tool for at least building some simpler um, user interface, especially if you're not doing it all the time. And then it's sometimes a little bit painful if you're dealing with multiple frameworks and then just takes a day to get back into the swing of things. So cool. Thanks, everyone. And hopefully I'll see you next time around.